Welcome to chapter two, an overview of the US healthcare system. After reading and going over the material in chapter two, you should be able to look critically at the healthcare system, identify major trends within the US healthcare system, and find information about health systems, not only the United States, but the rest of the developed world, and also use marginal analysis. Thinking about healthcare. So first, let's define inputs and outputs. An input is a good or service used in production, and an output is a good or service produced by an organization, okay? So let's remember those things as we continue um, to go over chapter two. Also, marginal analysis is the analysis of the effects of small changes in a decision variable. Um, this could be a price or a volume of an output on an outcome, cost profit or profitability of recovery. So let's think about those things as we continue into chapter two. Some key issues that we'll be looking at in chapter two are healthcare products are both inputs and outputs. Inputs into health and outputs of the healthcare sector. Healthcare products vary widely in health effects and also into the... The US health system is inefficient. Let's look at some numbers to see if we're actually able to uh, say this definitely, or is this just something that is trending and blogging um, and has no data to back up its relevance? Let's look at the life expectancy at birth um, in the United States. So the life expectancy at birth has risen in the United States from 2000 to 2015 from 76 point seven to doo -doo -doo -doo, about 78.7. Um, so there has been a significant, well, no, there, ha there has been a change, but not a significant change over the last 15 years um, in life expectancies from birth. So, health has improved more elsewhere at a much lower cost. So in France in 2000, their life expectancy was 79.2. And in 2015, their life expectancy is 82.4. In the United States, 76.7 and 78.7. Now the US is spending more on healthcare per person than any other developed country in the world. Just take a look at those numbers. Canada, about $5,000. France, about $5,000. Germany, a little over five and a half. Japan, right under five. Sweden, right at five and a half. And the UK, right above 4,000. We're shelling out almost $11,000 or $10,500, if you want to round more specifically, on healthcare per person. So our marginal analysis, what does this tell us? Um, let's look at the life expectancy again at birth over these developed countries and look at the change that has happened between 2000 and 2015. So it looks like France is doing the best job of keeping their citizens alive and the United States is not. Our per person spending, Again, what does this tell you? That since 2000, we have increased our spending by $4,700, but yet we have only increased the life expectancy by a little over two years. What is happening here? So this is the things that marginal analysis and healthcare economics tell us. So again, Marginal analysis, what's our delta in spending? Um, what is our delta in um, the, the life of years over these developed countries? Now let's look at some major trends in healthcare economics in the United States. Three trends continue to reshape healthcare. Rapid technology change, we talked about that in chapter one shrinking share of direct payments, and steady increase of private prices. Inflation. 
This is economics. Inflation does go into effect, and we will talk about that a bit. Price changes in medicine overall. So as you can see, with inflation and the gross domestic, gross domestic product, things go up and down, up and down. What has not moved at all is the price of medical expenses. It's not moving. It, it went from 4 to 3.8 over, this is, again, 15 years from 2000 to 2015. Um, we should see something more like the inflation rate, um, just like you see with the dollar bill. It goes up and it goes down. Healthcare does not do that. Shrinking share of direct payments. Direct payments are um, private insurer payments or a person who does not have um, insurance or has self-payers. Um, so we're seeing a shrinkage of that over these last years from 1960 to 2016, from over 44% down to almost 11%. So our technical changes, we have changes in diagnoses. Um, if any of you work in the health uh, field, you know that we went from ICD-9 to ICD-10 and there was a whole big change. And if you did not do it correctly, there were some um, fines and stipulations and even some cases where insurance companies opted not to pay for things because um, things were diagnosed and coded improperly. Um, changes in prevention, changes in therapy, turning diseases again into chronic conditions. This is what we see in ICD-9 to ICD-10. Lengthening of survival after diagnosis. So those are things like um, breast cancer survivors, where 20 years ago, if you were given a sentence of, um, if you were given a diagnosis of breast cancer, it was a life sentence. Now we are curing breast cancer more and more. We have more and more survivors of things of that nature. Improving quality of life after diagnosis, where once you are cured, once you are in remission of these cancers, um, lung cancer, breast cancer, brain tumors, um, we want to make sure that you have a great quality of life after, that you're not just sitting at home um, worried about if it's coming back or not doing anything to continue your health. We want to make sure that you're up and doing things. Um, and again, this adds on to our rapid technology change. So some examples of technology change includes tests and procedures like your 3D mammography, which is very, very popular, uh, low cost genetic screens, which are getting more and more popular. You see those on things um, uh, for commercial use like um, Ancestry.com, 23andMe, those types of things. Um, antivirals for hepatitis C um, have become um, much more sophisticated and much better um, and are causing less issues. Um, improved shingles vaccine, which is um, a very big problem for our baby boomers. Um, and the vaccine has gotten much, much better um, for those patients who um, have those types of issues. We have medical devices, things like knee brace, arm brace, brackets, um, chest clamps, um, and just support systems in general. How does technology change? Um, change in health, change in survival, change in well-being, change in cost, um, change in cost per procedures or change in number of procedures. Anytime there is a new and updated way of doing something, you get a increase of cost per procedure and an increase in the number of procedures. Um, example of great example of that would be the TAVR um, heart stent. Um, the TAVR probably is somewhere about um, between eleven and seventeen thousand dollars per cent. And when the TAVR came out, um, everybody who needed needed a procedure wanted one of those. Our doctors were pushing those very very hard. Um, when the physicians came to their leadership and said we wanted to do this, they were saying, hey, we'll probably do six in a year, maybe 10 in a year. Um, after the first couple years, we realized that uh, these cardiologists were doing 15 more a month. 15, 
15 more a month compared to 10 in a year. Um, so these things are increasing. These things are driving our cost. These things are the technology that is getting better. Um, it's ramping up, it's making life better for our patients. So these are some of the things that we will see. Some use of technology in our marginal benefit, so limited impacts on health, um, imaging for a headache, antibiotics for sin sinuses, um, EKG for low risk asymptomatic patients. Um, we don't see a major change in these things. These things really, um, it's a, a one off. Um, is this person having um, a headache to the point where the symptoms are mimicking um, strokes or aneurysm or things of that nature and they need special um, imaging, things of that nature? Um, so that's just one example here. Some uses of technology that are too expensive. A cheaper approach works just as well. So branded versus generic drugs, which is um, a very big thing. Drugs versus surgery for acid reflux. You see this um, sometimes where uh, some patients say, oh, the doctor is just cut happy. They just want to cut me open. I could have gotten a pill for that. Um, so those are just two examples. Um, benefits are small relative to cost. So clavets versus aspirin for stroke prevention or anti um, antifungals for a tonal discoloration. So we have to really outweigh the good and the bad um, per patient. Um, you have to remember that even as health econ um, economists that healthcare is per patient. Every single patient in your hospital, in your hospital bed, in your doctor's office, waiting rooms are completely different. This is not cogs on the wheel. This is not IT. This is not the space industry. Um, every single person is unique and different. And so we have to take that into consideration when making decisions, even with the best data and data points that we have. Overview of the Affordable Care Act. I know you all have heard of the Affordable Care Act, whether or not you like it, agree with it, or anything of that nature. It is part of um, our health system now, and we have to learn about how it works and how it benefits us and ways that in which it does not, so that those um, things can be changed and made better for our patients and consumers. So the key goals of um, the Affordable Care Act are expanding insurance coverages, reducing medical uh, Medicare spending, excuse me, and testing patient reforms. Expanding, expanding insurance coverage, changes in private insurance regulations, subs subsidies for low-income individuals, and funds for Medicaid expansion. So um, the changes in private insurance regulations are saying that um, you, you must insure these people. You cannot say that they have a pre-existing condition. You cannot say that once they reach a certain age, you're going to drop them. Um, you have to insure these people. Um, subsidies for low-income individuals. Um, for individuals whose um, jobs do not offer insurance, they should be able to um, have affordable health insurance. And this is what um, the subsidies do. You may be in a position where um, your job does not supply health insurance, but you'd make more than enough money where you cannot get free health insurance um, through government aids. So the Affordable Care Act, allows for subsidies for low-income individuals. And finally, funds for Medicaid expansion. We want to be able to take care of our elderly patients no matter what. They are living on um, a restricted income. Um, they don't have much. And those are the, our patients who, who really are our sickest. They are our higher acuity, acuity patients. And we want to make sure that we take care of them as best as possible. The share with insurance has gone up since passage of the Affordable Care Act. So as you can see, in 1999, we were at about 86.5%, and we have gone all the way up to 91.2% in 2015. So that means that we're still four, year behind, four years behind. Our book was published in 2019, um, but it's still, you know, um, a couple years behind. So we can see that there was a significant change um, with our insurance um, with the passage of the Affordable Care Act over the last 16 years. The biggest changes are still to come. We are looking at the full risk for the insurer, um, what can be paid by the individual, um, 
sensitive uh, premium differences, sensitive um, to the price differences in long-term relationships to um, health insurers as well. So let's talk about why are U.S. costs so high? Primarily because negotiated prices are high and variable. We negotiate our prices in the United States, so every price is different. That's why you can look on the internet and find um, what the price is from one street to the next. Differences in negotiated prices are trade secrets. Nobody will tell. It is a secret. They get upset when this information is shared and they might increase your price just because. Consumers do not respond to price differences. Consumers do not care about price differences. Consumers want quality and low cost. So as an example, let's look at the private abdomen um, CT scan price. So Spain, Switzerland, and the U.S. Spain pays about $85 per CT. Switzerland, about $383. In the U.S., we have three different pricing. About $280, about $850. And then 95% of us are paying about $2,300 per CT scan. These are because of negotiated pricing. Um, where you fall in your tier, what type of insurance you have, um, where you live in the United States, um, whether or not you went to a rural, a community, or a metro hospital, or a healthcare organization, or if you went to an outside um, radi uh, radiology, ultrasound, scanning. Um, it's just so many variables that you have a big jump from 287 to $2,300. Again, these are things that uh, we take a look at in healthcare economics. Hospitals and MD pricing for a normal delivery. So in Switzerland, they pay about $7,700, Australia $5,300, and again, you can see the three different tiers um, of pricing that we pay here in the United States, $8,000, $10,000, almost $11,000, and right over $18,000 for a normal delivery. Um, again, private appendectomy price. Spain, $2,000, Australia, $38, Switzerland, $6,000. In the U.S., we could pay all the way up to $33,000, depending on those three different negotiations, those three different criterias. Um, we have people in the 25th percentile, and people in the 95th percentile, and most of us are in the 95th percentile. Conclusion. The U.S. healthcare system is the world's most expensive system and delivers mediocre outcomes. Life expectancy in the United States has improved. However, um, it's higher than Mexico, but lower than Canada. U.S. healthcare costs are higher than other rich countries, mainly because of high private pricing are um, increasing less rapidly in the past. Um, this is because of the Affordable Care Act, high deductibles, um, and other things as well. Finally, the healthcare system is changing. Less inpatient care, more outpatient care, new payment model systems, and expansion use of data. The destination of where our healthcare system is not going, but we do know that it is changing. We need to get from mediocre to excellent and superb, and this is the goal for every healthcare organization, and it is the main and primary goal for a health economist as well, to um, dive deep and dig to find out where we are lacking so that we can bring that superior care to our patients.